So in Hong Kong, uh, a top three financial center, we often talk about just the stock market, uh, real estate, and lately politics as well. Today, I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about innovation, science, and technology. You know, as an international city, we basically don't grow our own crops. We don't even have enough of our own water. So one might ask, why science and technology? So perhaps these are the exact reasons why we should be thinking about it more seriously. So what is science and what is technology? It's not stereotypically about mixing solution A and solution B to get solution C, hopefully with a different color and some funky precipitate. It's a very, very important first step for our kids and teenagers to learn about the ABC, but this obviously isn't it. And we Hong Kong people often associate technology with IT, cell phone apps, games, etc., etc. As a scientist, I've got a slightly different view. So these are extremely important, and in some cases, even very innovative tools for bringing all of us into closer, way closer proximity in the virtual cyberspace. Um, without undermining the importance and convenience, um, these are technically uh, just derivative and translation products of science and technology, but not science and technology per se, if you understand what I'm saying. So David, for instance, has just offered a New York uh, Times bestseller, uh, very popular, high literature value, but I'm almost sure that he wouldn't claim to have invented a new language. So in my own uh, humble opinion, uh, what is technology? For example, optical fibers for intercontinental telecommunication and light speed uh, internet. Uh, a mainframe computer like several three, four decades ago, about the size of this room, and the ability to really shrink it down to the size of the cell phone, yet with a higher computing capability. That's the kind of technology that I'm talking about. So uh, we also have to be careful about defining innovation, science, slash technology. An innovative idea doesn't have to be technological or scientific in nature. And in the same vein, uh, technological evolution or even revolution doesn't have to be conceptually uh, innovative. And then as an example, today's cars still have four wheels. They are basically not different from what they were about a century ago in the times of Carl Benz and Henry Ford. However, innovation and science slash technology, they are not mutually exclusive. They don't come together that often. You know, let it be every few years, a decade, a few decades, even a century. But when they come along, not only do they change the way we live, but even more importantly, they change the way we think. And here are a few of my favorite examples. Galileo got sent to jail for his innovative saying that the Earth should not be the center of the galaxy. And based on his groundwork, Isaac Newton came up with uh, the Newton's law because of the falling apple. And as such, Albert Einstein came up with the relativity, the equation E equals the MC square, and as a result, which arguably led to the development of the Manhattan Project and therefore the atomic bomb that ended the Second World War. In biomedicine, the discovery of the alpha helical structure of DNA leading to transgenic recombinant DNA technology and a few guys in California founded this obscure company called Genetat, which only later grew to become uh, more than a hundred uh, billion US dollar enterprise plus more. And the discovery of uh, penicillin, uh, I don't have to tell you how many tens of millions of people that discovery has saved. And since the beginning of the millennium with two Nobel Prizes awarded, it's been widely accepted that stem cell and regenerative medicine is such a game changer. So the question is, what are stem cells? What is regenerative medicine? According to Merriam-Webster, regeneration is an ad, a process, by which an entity gets replaced, renewed, restored, or revived. So what is technically challenging it's actually regenerative medicine, it's conceptually simple. It's like you have a light bulb, it's blown. What are you gonna do? 
you take it out, get a new one, and put it back on. So it's just as conceptually simple as this. In Amazing Spider-Man, the villain, Dr. Kurt Corners, lost his arm, and he wanted to grow it back by injecting himself with a, you know, some kind of reptile serum and only ended up becoming a lizard monster. Why lizard? So it turns out that there, there is some scientific basis after all. Lizard can lose his tail so as to run away from his predator and only to regrow it back later. You are looking at a sal salamander. No, you know, not my favorite, cutest kind of animal, but what you're about to see or what I'm about to tell you is amazing. It's got arms, it can wiggle like mine, like yours, but if you chop it off, it's going to grow back on its own, miraculously. This is absolutely amazing. So we know, when it, uh, as far as the ability to regrow is concerned, we homo sapiens are a lot less than simpler organisms. We are no referring. Uh, you know, we know uh, he can heal from a bullet hole on his own. We do possess, however, some ability to regenerate. Let's say you've got a cut on your skin, depending on how big the wound is, assuming that it's not terribly, terribly bad. You're going to be able to heal on your own, right? But our many other vital organs are just not as lucky because we don't have the same kind of regenerative uh, stem cells. For instance, if you have a coronary disease, myocardial infarction, heart attack, and your heart cells are gone, they're going to be gone forever. And the same thing when it happens in the brain, that's called a stroke. Accidental injury of your spinal cord, depending on where the damage is, one might become paralyzed from the neck all the way down. And you know, this late uh, Hollywood star, uh, Christopher Reeve, the Superman, was a big time advocate for stem cell research. So how do we replace or regenerate? To make toys, you need to have some sort of raw material, plastic for instance. To remake human organs, you need human stem cells. So the question is, what are stem cells? And this is very important for you to remember. Stem cells are just a collective term. There are at least a billion different types. So if one doesn't specify what particular stem cell type he or she is working on professionally, it really doesn't mean anything at all. And the more specialized you are, the more information you ask for. And as an analogy, it's like your teenage daughter comes home one day and tells you that I have just made a friend. And you're like, tell me more. And she goes, a human. You know, it doesn't mean anything. You've got to provide more information. The gender, the age, uh, the ethnic group, nationality, height, education, occupation, etc., etc. So one has to be more defined in order for you to be able to tell something. So uh, among billion different types, just for the purpose of this talk, let me now just focus on what many of my colleagues and myself think is the king of all, pluripotent stem cell. So um, they are special, unique in at least two ways. One is that they can function as a factory, basically providing you with unlimited supply of raw material. And secondly, they have the ability to transform their identities, to basically become all cell types of the body, uh, including the rarest, terminally differentiated types such as heart cells, brain cells, pancreatic cells, liver cells, etc., etc. So it's like you have at home this stem cell, pluripotent stem cell buddy. If you get sick, he becomes a doctor to provide you with free uh, medical health care. And if you need legal advice, he instantly becomes an attorney. Or if you need financial help, he becomes a banker or accounting, accountant. And if you want to host a party, he can instantly become a chef as well. Not only one, but as many as you like. So do you want something like this? Are you excited about this? If your answer happens to be a yes, that's exactly why the public, medical, and scientific communities are so excited about stem cell. Now, let me show you uh, a video just to demonstrate some of the work that we have done in the area of heart regeneration. All we have to do basically to start the process is to obtain like a single draw of blood from you with as little as uh, 2.5 mil and other uh, tissue samples also work, uh, for instance, a skin biopsy. So with a technique called uh, reprogramming, uh, originally developed by the Nobel laureate Shania Yamanaka, we can uh, transform your blood cells, uh, in this case, mononucleated blood cells into the kind of uh, prepotent stem cells that I was telling you about. 
And this is the raw, starting raw material that I was telling you. And, one, and from here on, I'm going to be telling you about the technologies that we have developed in-house. So basically, we add another uh, cocktail with a special kind of molecular uh, recipe. We can instruct this uh, stem cell to become human heart cells. Here, you're looking at one. And within days, we can match produce billions and more. And uh, my daughter and son would tell you that uh, magic is not real, but science is. But advanced sciences without a good understanding can be mistaken as magic. So you're looking at, this is not fairy dust. If you take about a million of the fundamental building blocks that I was telling you about and put into an incubator, within just a few days, you'll be able to fabricate a contracting functional human heart muscle that belongs to you. So think about it as a possibility in future. It will be the band-aid for uh, myocardial infarction and heart attack. And how about 10 times, 20 times, 100 times more cell? We put these building blocks into another custom tailor bioreactor. Within days, we'll be able to fabricate a functional contracting human ventricular chamber or miniaturized human heart, if you will. That belongs to John Doe of the US, Jane Doe of Canada, you know, someone from uh, China, Japan, uh, Australia, you name it. It can be individualized, and that's the power. And I'm showing you what we have done in the area of heart regeneration. But my other colleagues are working on other organ systems as well. So the question is, what do we do with these tools? And we are currently using these technologies to try to revolutionize the discovery of uh, new drugs and therapeutics. We will be transplanting. And uh, I'm a big believer that in the very near future, there will be banks of bioartificial organs available for a range of medical purposes. In science, there is no finishing line. The race is on us. So getting back to the theme of this talk, Lever Stop, uh, whether you like it or not, whether you know about it or not, this bioengine of the massive stem cell train is already running. The question is, how can you stop it? How can anyone stop it? You can choose to decide not to get on it, though. I think it's not innovative for people to be just talking about innovation because other people in town are talking about it. Rather, Join us. I'd like to invite you to join us. Let's re-engineer engineering. Let's innovate innovations. And when our people are innovative and scientifically driven, so is our city. I've got a dream. Stem cell has become my dream since the loss of our second child, who could have been saved by more mature stem cell technologies. Thank you. <laughs>